All right, guys, we're back again with another great episode of PFREI, Passion for Real Estate Investments. I'm your host, Fuquan Bilal. Today, we have Nick Elder. We're here today. We're going to talk about some multifamily stuff. Uh, another investor who made the transition, I guess we'll get into it if you're 100% out of the single family. Now I'm doing some multifamily stuff. We'll talk about why. But uh, before we get started in the interview, Nick, let the uh, audience know a little bit about your background and how you got started in real estate. Yeah, so definitely appreciate you having me here. Uh, really excited to have this conversation. Uh, my career began outside of real estate. I was in the healthcare industry right out of college, started in pharmaceutical sales, uh, did a number of different ventures in the healthcare world uh, for the following you know, five years or so. And then August 2021, uh, so excuse me, 2022, uh, got laid off from my pharmaceutical sales job. I had real estate investing sort of as a side hustle at the time. Um, but when I got laid off, I said, you know, that's the end of that. Uh, no longer going to be in healthcare, not going to do pharmaceutical sales. Very passionate about real estate, love real estate. And so I really went all in on my real estate venture. Uh, and so fast forward to today, uh, I'm, I work at, I'm on the investor relations team where I raise a lot of the capital at Ironton Capital. Uh, we've raised about 50 million, a little over 50 million in the last about year and a couple months uh, across all of our different funds. And then I also have my uh, other company uh, with two other business partners, and we do some uh, single family fix and flips and smaller syndication deals. So I've got two companies going on here at once. Uh, love them both. Love the projects that we're embarking on. And I love partnering up with our uh, limited partners to to expand their wealth. Mm. Yeah, that's great. It's um, it's amazing. I'm listening to your story, how you uh, something that you thought was bad turned into something good. And now you are on your way onward and upward doing, I guess, you know, what you're passionate about. And uh, why, why are you passionate for real estate investing? That's a great question. You know, I uh, I started my journey uh, in 2019. I bought a house, single family, three bed, three bath in Denver. Uh, I bought it moved into it and I rented out the other two bedrooms to, to roommates and effectively eliminated my rent. And so at the same time, I increased my income and I was saving all this money and I just kind of really started to feel the power of uh, growing your wealth through real estate, even doing something as simple as like a house hack, like I just highlighted. Yeah, yeah. I was and say. yeah, I really started to recognize the potential and uh, it was something I didn't even know that I had until I started doing it. And from there, I just kind of really just started to see the possibilities. I bought another house hack and I was like, man, this is, this is great. And then we went through the, the massive appreciation party in Denver. I saw my net worth, you know, expand by about triple digits just from the appreciation party we had in the market. Um, but I realized it wasn't scalable and I saw other people in multifamily doing what they were doing and um, just started to recognize I invested in some syndications myself, saw the power of it saw what it was doing to my wealth and you know the passion stemmed from that and wanting to be the guy that is doing that for others uh in our limited partners and so just kind of this passion came out of nowhere and five years later i'm still feeling it and i know it's what i want to do for the rest of my life and the That's passion awesome. is really just helping others grow their wealth through real estate in ways that they didn't even know know was available to them yeah, it's um, it's amazing. I I kind of made the same pivot three and a half years ago to multifamily. Still doing some fix and flips, so I have some of the same models. Some fix and flips here in New Jersey, where I've been investing the last twenty four years, and multifamily in the southeast units from forty to one hundred and fifty units. And you know, I'm pretty sure you ran across the same thing. Like, man, why didn't I start off with this? Right? Why did I have to do this fix and flip stuff and deal with all these contractors and all this other stuff? Is you know, fix and flips are great, right? It's very transactional. To have a blend of both is important, I think, for diversity. But the multifamily, right, is nothing like that. And then after being a multifamily three and a half years, a buddy of mine does storage. And I'm like, he's like, you know, I get to do this without dealing with any tenants. Is this a square box with electricity, you no know, toilets or anything? And I'm like, well, that's great. You know, if you're, you know, just looking at the money part of it, but what we do more is for an impact to the community, providing housing for low income and stuff. But yeah, there's a lot of shiny squirrels out there. Um, just got to dig in your heels and, and stay go deep on what you're doing. So yeah. let's talk about the multifamily stuff. Where, what part of the the uh, U.S. are you doing that strategy and what deal size are you focusing on? So yeah. 
<clears throat> yeah, so at Ironton Capital, we've got our National Diversified Fund. It's a blend of new development and value-add projects that go all the way from a single-family home development project in Denver to you know, 300 plus units in luxury class A and workforce housing. So our, 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 our motto is diversification. And so we're really capturing a blend of mostly multifamily, but various different strategies and asset classes in the Northwest, Southeast, um, you know, in Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and then up in the Northwest that I just highlighted, we have a couple projects in Michigan and then we have several here in Denver so we're really, you know, kind of in all, all over the place, but in uh, high population growth, tax advantaged states uh, mm-hmm. is what, where we really focus. Um, and I personally have a 25 unit under contract that I'm working through the due diligence on in Fayetteville, Arkansas right now. Um, so really love that market in the Northwest Arkansas region. Um, but yeah, we're just, you know, in short, you know, kind of a long answer to a short question. Uh, we're really kind of all over the place, all over the U.S., um, but all over the place as far as, you know, what we like to do in multifamily, deal size, et cetera. Um, you know, so we like diversification and as much as we can diversify for our limited partners, the better. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, you mentioned something that, how, how do you guys handle logistics being that, that spread out, right? So you said, um, you know, Southeast, Northeast, um, I believe you said northeast, or you said north, north, midwest. What did you say? You Michigan, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michigan is kind of an outlier state that we're involved in, and then mostly in the southeast and then the northwest. So at Ironton, we invest as a limited partner with sponsors that who we know have a great track record. So we team up with developers and operators in say the, the southeast, like Florida and South Carolina. Uh, who know the market, they've got expert knowledge, um, they've got the systems in place, maybe they're vertically integrated, they have a really good process, and they've got a strong track record. We invest with them as a limited partner, we'll invest anywhere from like a million to $3 million in their project. Um, And then we go out to our investors and raise our capital. So a lot of these sponsors that we work with, it's hard to get into their deals unless you're a repeat investor or you're writing a check of a million dollars or more. And a lot of people just don't have those capabilities. And so that's what we offer at Ironton Capital. We then go to our investors and we'll raise capital at a minimum of maybe 25 to 50,000. And we can give them access to these institutional quality deals in these top competing markets. And you guys are going as an LP as opposed to GP? Yeah, we have some co-GP projects, but for the most part, we're taking a large LP position. In a okay. Project. Yep. And you're probably LP in a capital stack is just senior lender than you guys. There's no mezzanine involved with that. Yeah, correct. We're on the common equity side. So we haven't really taken a pref equity position yet, but we're looking at it. Okay. Awesome. What, um, what do you see, I guess, you know, where, how is the market affecting your business? Because interest rates are high. I mean, on the buy side, I know there's some turmoil there. What are some of the things you guys experience on the multifamily side and the market you're in? Yeah, you know, we're saying no to a lot more deals. I mean, the reality is, I'm sure you saw, is that two years ago, you can get into a deal with max leverage. You could put 25, 30% down and the DCR pencils out on cheaper agency financing. Um, now you're having to come to the table with, you know, maybe 40, 45% sometimes. And the returns just aren't there. You know, you're looking at an IRR a couple of years ago in the mid 20s, and now you're looking at maybe upper teens on the deal level IRR and it's just not as attractive anymore. Yeah. Uh, So we're seeing that a lot. Um, You know, we've got really good relationships. That's why we're doing a lot more on the new development side. Um, So we're developing new apartment complexes or we have some residential townhome development projects locally. That's where we're seeing more of the opportunities right now, as opposed to the value add projects that we had saw two years ago that just aren't penciling out nowadays. Yeah, that makes sense. We're kind of doing the same thing on the residential side, the new construction. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, you know, it's not worth rehabbing these old houses and finding problem after problem and digging into the bottom line and you get it to the table and the seller wants to negotiate you down. So exactly. the new construction does make sense. Um, what, what about on the, on how long is the hold? Is it a five to seven year play? Is it something short term? What does that look like? Yeah, uh, you know, the short 
the, the whole period has kind of changed as the environments change. You know, some of the projects we're investing in, um, for example, we're investing in a, in a, a fund of a fund. So we're investing in an, in one company that's going out and building, say, eight to 12 apartment complexes. And so when we blend that with our National Diversified Fund, we're typically projecting maybe a four to six year hold period. Um, but some of these smaller development projects we're finding are more in the tune of two to three years. But I think when you average out the entire fund that we have, we're looking at more of like a four to six year hold period. Um, you know, we'd love to get out of these projects sooner, but the reality of the market is we don't know what the next three to five years looks like. Yeah. Be in a lower interest rate environment, but a lot of our partners, they're projecting a little bit more on the five to seven year time period just to plan for the worst of the worst um, as far as the economy goes. Are you having investors like push back because of the timeline or, you know, I, this market, the growth market is is pretty much slow mm -hmm. on both ends, on the acquisition side, investors sitting on the sideline. Um, are you having investors that are still looking to jump into deals or is it a little slow raising capital? I mean, because I know from a few other guys who do this, they're having some challenge with the investors having the confidence in the market because we're the market at, you know, particularly on a deal if it doesn't have permanent financing. Like if it's not... 90 percent occupied or more than you know they're not looking for looking to invest into deals that has bridge debt so are you guys seeing any struggles on that on that front where maybe the sponsor who's running a deal might have some bridge debt with a capex play to remodel raise rents and yada 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 yeah that's a great question uh yeah i would say things have slowed down a little bit um especially with our diversified growth fund that we have I think it's more, you know, at least in my conversations with investors, it's not necessarily, there's a few of them that are maybe concerned about the economy and they're not moving forward. A lot of our investors, naturally, they've got large portfolios in Denver uh, and they're selling those properties to invest with us. And so for that reason, that slowed down our capital raising period just because of the nature of who we work with as an investor. Um, but no doubt, I mean, you know, talking to other operators in the area or not just in the area, but just in connections that I have, the capital raising has stalled. Um, interestingly enough, we just launched a medium term income fund and we raised about $10 million for that in a span of two to three weeks. But it's an income fund. It's not growth. So we're able to offer quarterly dividends to investors right away. So I think maybe we're seeing more investors that are, you know, maybe their goals are pivoting a little bit more to protecting them in something such as an income fund in the event that we go into a recession versus locking their capital up for a three to five or maybe even six year period. Yeah, it's it's a debt market, right? I was yeah. just on a debate the other day, debt versus equity. And uh, we won, it was 58% uh, to 42%. Is that the right math? I think that's the right math. So yeah, we won uh, 58, 42 and, and you know, they said debt over equity in this market. I mean, a win, if you're investing in debt, the win is to your back. Yep. Um, I think it's a strategic play that you guys did with the income fund because people are looking for, of course, if it's profitable to pay those distributions, people are looking for a set distribution that they mm -hmm. can count on versus a six pref, eight pref, and, you know, 22% IRR are you going to get, you know, people want to know, you know, they'll take less, but they want to know this is something realistic they can get. So that's the market we're in. And that's what I was saying earlier. You know, this is going to be the market for the next three years, right? We don't know when it's going to come back. And, the higher the cap rate, the lower the purchase price. So it's good for us as buyers, right? But at the same time, um, you know, there's challenges on the other end that you have in the market raising capital and everything else. Getting deals is less than money spent occupied. You mm -hmm. got to kiss a lot of frogs to find the right deal. So um, your buy box, I know the state test you're in, the number of units, what's the smallest to the largest that you guys would take down? Because I know you said you got a 25 unit under contract. Yeah. Um, you know, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So for my personal portfolio with my two business partners outside of Ironton Capital, we're looking for sub 50 units and we really like the Northwest Arkansas market. Um, you know, once we take this deal down, we'll probably continue to look for more deals there. Um, you know, we like sub 50 units. It's right within our price range. This 25 unit is at a $2.05 million purchase price. So it's not a large raise. Um, the challenging component of that is that you need to really you need to, it needs to be significantly under market rent to have a strong IRR on something that small. And this project fits that buy box. Um, you know, but we like sub 50 units, probably under 40 or sorry, under 4 million. 
And when you're getting to that point, you're not dealing with a lot of competition um, that I've seen, at least, you know, you're not competing with, uh, you know, the, the institutional firms or anything like that. Uh, you're also probably even eliminating a good chunk of the other 80% of competition. Um, and we really like, we like self-managed properties as well. Um, as we're going through this one, we're finding that there's a lot of opportunities where the previous owner was maybe self-managing the property. That's where we typically find these yeah. assets. Maybe they're willing to sell or finance it, or we can assume the debt, or or, or maybe it's just a function of, you know, they were, you know, for example, this owner, like he's just, he hasn't increased his rents because he wants to keep it hundred percent occupied and he doesn't want to have any vacancy just for the sake of his own income. Right. And so for that reason, you're looking at an apartment complex that's $500 under the market. Um, so we like that. And I think we'll probably continue to hone in on opportunities such as that. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah. you can structure, especially in this market where there's a lot of creative financing opportunities and you can get yep. the seller. Hey, you don't want to trigger a big tax event. Why don't you do some strategic financing and, you know, we'll give you a chunk of cash up front. And you can do deals that are less than 90 percent occupied when you do find something like that. Right. Because now you have permanent financing in place from three to five years, whatever you structure with the seller. You can execute your CapEx plan, your occupancy plan, get it up there, get permanent financing to take them out. There's no prepayment penalty. You usually can get it for something like a six percent, you know, seven percent with the owner. So. Those are very creative. I like you. I like that you mentioned that, and you will find a lot of that on a smaller deal. So, you know, if you're able to get in there and do some creative stuff with the smaller deals, is great. Plus, it gives you the ability to sell out those smaller deals. Right? It's easier to sell a 25, 40 unit versus 150 unit. Right? You absolutely get it in, stabilize, fix it up. Boom, you're out of there. So, you know. Yeah, we launched a workforce housing fund in Denver, and we partnered with a local operator. And a lot of the deals he was getting was seller finance. Financing. And I mean, it was, I don't know what seller would agree to some of these terms. I think they'd be in quite a bind, but you know, one of them we got at 91% loan to value, eight years interest only at three and a half percent, no prepayment wow. penalty. Yeah. That's like somebody seller. who just don't want to deal with the headache, right? They they wanted just a little yeah. bit of cash flow. They didn't want to deal with the headache anymore. Um, they can make more money off of a note that they can count on versus probably making a little bit more from them self managing and dealing with the headaches. You're exactly right. Yeah. You know, not every, uh, I mean, most owners are going to be like, well, that doesn't make that much sense, but you could be dealing with an owner that's just, you know, he's, it's such a huge headache, like you just outlined and he wants to get rid of it. He could probably get equal, if not better cash flow, just by being the financing partner on this, on the deal. And so, you know, this kind of goes back to finding the right partners to partner with, because, you know, this individual is just highly skilled at finding really good deals and being creative. And for that reason, you know, we're leveraging his expertise, going out to our investors, and we raised about a million and a half for that fund. And just by, you know, who we know and partnering with the right folks. Um, and that's the value that I think, you know, we can really offer to our to our partners at Ironton Capital. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. This is a really great conversation. If you guys want to find more information about Nick and his his opportunities have available, give them the, the LinkedIn, Nick, that they can reach out to you and check you out. Yeah, that's perfect. No, oh, the LinkedIn site. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, Nick, Nick Elder, Elder Real Estate. Estate, right? Yeah, that's it. Yep. Nick Elder Real Estate. Check them out on uh, on LinkedIn. See what, so, you know, get a conversation with them. Talk a little bit more about his business model. Yeah, I like having uh, real estate investors that are actively involved uh, on on a show. You know, of course, you have to do your own due diligence, whatever who you're dealing with. Um, it, you know, it's it's good to see that. Because there's a lot of people who are promoters, right? Who are just raising capital or doing things that they're not actually doing the deal, right? So, um, and a lot of people don't understand the capital stack. Things that they're investing is important. So you have the senior lien debt that's there. Sometimes sponsors and operators will go out and get mezzanine financing and do, or they do a syndication um, to fill up the gap from the senior lien to whatever it is to close. But more than likely, you'll see, and if you are a buyer, I mean, an investor, you definitely want to look at the capital stack, right? If there's any mezzanine that is important because you'll be in third position, right? And, and how secure are you if the operator doesn't execute? What a lot of people don't understand is asset management is the most challenging part of the business, right? Finding a deal, getting a good price, evaluating it, all that sexy. We close, we pop the bottles, everybody's excited. But the real work comes with asset management, right? Can that sponsor execute on what they said they can do? So- you definitely want to find someone who is experienced. 
I know that a lot of the challenges I had, Nick, when I got involved was going full cycle on a deal. Most yeah, people yeah. who invest in multifamily want to know, okay, did you go full cycle? Did you buy? Did you do your strategy? Did you wind up selling? How many of those you did? So they can see, you know, what the experience is. So if you are an investor out there, you definitely want to align yourself with someone who's full cycle, who's went through the, got the lumps over their head and went through all of that. So appreciate you coming on the show today. Thanks for having um, me. This is a great interview. Another great episode of PFREI, Passion for Real Estate Investors. Make sure you guys check us out on YouTube. If you see us there, please like and share. And you can catch us wherever you see other podcasts. Thanks for coming on the show today, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great being here. I enjoyed the conversation. Awesome.